Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As you have just heard, my name is Stanley Tinska. As for the topic of my presentation, neither bacteria nor cancer need any kind of introduction, as we have all heard of them. I have worked with both bacterial and carcinogen cells in my laboratory, and today I would like to share with you how do they influence us and each other. Let me start by stating that cancer is probably by far the most covered topic of modern medicine, and it is so for a reason. Every year, cancer affects as many people as there live in Warsaw. Warsaw and 85 next most populated cities of Poland. That is 14 million people every year. What makes cancer so vicious and cruel in taking both our health and life is that it uses evolution to its own advantage, both in the micro and macro scale. In micro scale, evolution occurs through mutations. All our cells mutate constantly, it's perfectly normal, but some of them accumulate enough mutations to change. They start growing and multiplying very rapidly. They take all of the nutrients for themselves. They don't differentiate to fulfill their, their role in organism. They become selfish. And just as in life, the selfish ones are most successful. So starts to dominate first in the tissue, then in the organ, and then in the organism. In macro scale, evolution sometimes eradicates some diseases. But for that to happen, a disease must appear before we have passed our genes to further generations. Cancer is patient. It takes a lot of years for mutations to accumulate in the cell, so usually it appears only at the 60th or 70th year of life. By then, we have already given our genes to our children, and evolution is helpless. We stand alone in war with cancer, and to fight better, we need to know our enemy. So what is the tumor like? As I have already told you, it grows and multiplies very fast. It takes many nutrients for, them, for itself so that it could grow and multiply even faster. It consumes a lot of energy and so produces lactic acid, similar to our muscles when we exercise. It finds ways to either inactivate immune cells or become invisible for them. So unlike other diseases, we cannot trust our body to cope with it. Finally, the tumor environment is anoxygenic. It is because it grows too fast for the veins to keep up with making, and so blood doesn't reach it and doesn't bring any oxygen. With this knowledge and many more facts that we have learned of, about cancer over those years, we have come up with a number of therapies, which could be div divided into three main groups. If we want to stay safe, we go for no casualties model, when we are sure that only cancer cells would be affected. However, that safety has its price. In case of surgery, the price is uncertainty. We are never 100% sure if all of the tumor has been cut out and it takes only one single cell for the disease to come back. In case of tar targeted therapies, which focus on characteristic traits of tumor metabolism, the, pr the price is literal, because it takes a lot of time to develop such a therapy, and thus it is very expensive. Also, such therapies are very narrow. They are focused only on one single specific kind of cancer. If there is no such therapy available, we need to go for the casualties model, when all of our cells are affected, both cancer and healthy ones. Such therapies are radiotherapy and chemotherapy, the most famous ones, I think. Of course, we do, all, uh, we do our best to focus them on the tumor. However, even despite those efforts, it becomes a cruel lace between human and the tumor, as for who will surrender to chemistry or radioactivity first. No person should be forced to undergo such horror. There is also a third way, a compromise, which connects both safety of no casualties model and also certainty of casualties model, a semi-targeted treatment, casualties on site, which means that any kind of cell could be affected. However, we focus the treatment precisely at the site of the tumor. In my personal opinion, those are the best kinds of treatments we have come up with so far. However, to talk about them, I need to move on to bacteria. 
However, I will not talk about diseases. There will be no antibiotics in my lecture because bacteria can actually be our allies. They can help us fight cancer. I have a question for you. When do you think did we notice that? When did we figure out that bacteria can actually help us cure cancer? What do you think? How long ago? 10 years ago? Who thinks 10 years ago? Okay, here's a very gentle one. Who thinks 100 years ago? Another hand. Actually, it was four and a half. Oh my God. What did I do? It was four and a half thousand years ago. In ancient Egypt, a physician noticed that swellings, which is what they called tumors back then, react to infections. Sadly, that knowledge was lost until 19th century when those observations were made once again. There was even an attempt of a dangerous experiment when a woman sick of cancer was infected deliberately. The tumor did regress. However, the woman sadly died because of the infection. At the beginning of 20th century, William Coley gathered all those data, and thanks to that, he developed his very own therapy, SAFER. And his results were tremendous. They were even better than the ones we achieve today with our modern medicine, our modern technology. So why wasn't this therapy put into wider use, you might ask? There are two reasons for that. First one is public relations. Radiotherapy was developed at a similar time, and radioactivity, which back then was a fashionable novelty, seemed to be a much better idea than bacteria which do cause diseases. Second answer is jealousy. Collie's boss was envious of his employee's success and did everything he could to hinder it. Thanks to those hinders, it wasn't until 1980s when we came back to bacterial anti-cancer ther therapy. And they are a perfect example of, ta of targeted treatment, casualties on site model, as I, have, as I said before. It is because bacteria have a number of reasons to localize in the tumor. As I said before, it is rich in nutrition, bacteria need to eat too. It is immunosuppressive. They feel safe there because there is no, 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 no immune cells for to, be, to be danger for them. Lack of an oxygen doesn't affect them. They don't always need oxygen to survive. Acid is an upside for us. It triggers specific reactions in bacteria, and we can change those reactions so that bacteria could actually produce anti-cancer drugs. So what should be bacteria for us to make a perfect weapon. First, they should be specific to localize solely in the area of tumor. They should be affordable, which is quite obvious, I think. Flexible, able to affect as many kinds of tumors as possible. Efficient, because a weapon must work for us to use it. Above all, they should be safe. We cannot go back to 1860s when an innocent woman died because we couldn't control bacteria. Those are the expectations, and what's the reality? As I have already told you, there is no problem with specificity. Bacteria have even too many reasons to localize in the tumor. They are also less expensive than other anti-cancer therapies, which, of course, says they are affordable. Problems start with flexibility. As Coley and other researchers after him proved, bacteria are effective in curing skin, bone, muscle, ovary, and kidney cancer. Five types of cancer is actually very good, but we would like them to be even of wider range. As for efficiency, that is what we scientists provide. Bacteria themselves aren't as dangerous to the tumor as they could be, so we make them produce dangerous, dangerous compounds. They could be either anti-cancer drugs, which is a very good idea, however, they are usually very complex, and bacteria don't always produce them sufficiently. Second idea is make bacteria produce bacterial toxins, which serve as a signal of alarm for the immune system to notice that there is a problem in the area, and it needs to act. Those toxins, however, could be dangerous to our health, so we need to watch out. 
We need to also remember that safety could actually be, be our hindrance because the safer we make bacteria for us, the safer they are for the tumor. We need to fight a golden proportion between our safety and the and the destroys dis and and to destroy the tumor. In the end, our bacteria, a perfect miraculous weapon we were looking for all the time, they are not. They are not yet. However, I strongly believe that with the right amount of time, right amount of research, and right choices on the way, we could make them strong, powerful allies in the war with cancer. Thank you very much.